Welcome back to Discrete Differential Geometry. Last time we talked about differentiation. Today we're going to talk about integration. And although we're going to talk about integration of differential forms, this is really just the story of integration. If you've ever taken an integral in your life, you have, whether you knew it or not, been integrating differential forms. You've been kind of adding up little measurements of volume. Okay, so as we discussed last time, there are two big ideas in calculus. One is differentiation, one is integration, which we'll cover today, and those are linked by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Exterior calculus generalizes these ideas to differential k forms. So last time we talked about the exterior derivative, and this time we'll talk about what it means to integrate a differential k form. How do we measure volume? Just like we had the fundamental theorem of calculus before, we now have this more general theorem called Stokes' theorem that will relate integration and differentiation in a very important way. This theorem comes up all over geometry and math and physics, and for us, it's also going to show up in computation because the way we're going to do calculations on meshes is to integrate differential forms over elements of our mesh to get something called discrete exterior calculus. And that will be the topic of the next couple lectures. Okay, So let's talk about integration. What does integration mean? What's the intuitive idea? Maybe the easiest starting point is to think about not integrating a function at all, but just think about integrating an area. How do I get the total area of, let's say, a region omega in the plane? Well, one intuitive way to think about it is I'm going to chop up this region into, let's say, blocks of equal size. We call those A sub I. And I'm going to sum up all the blocks that cover some part of this shape. Now, of course, that's going to give me an overestimate of the area of this region. But the thinking is that if I were to chop this up into smaller and smaller and smaller blocks, then under reasonable conditions on the shape of omega, this sum is going to converge to an integral as we refine. And by the way, if you ever get lost or confused about what's happening in that integral sign, it can be really helpful to just come back to this picture of sums. I'm just taking my object, I'm chopping it up, and I'm measuring each little piece adding up those sizes. Okay? So with that picture in mind, what does it mean to integrate a scalar function? So let's say we have our same domain omega, but this time we have a scalar function phi that assigns a real value to every point of this domain. Now when we chop up the plane into little blocks, each one of them has some value associated with it. Or what we could do is say, okay, at the center point P, I'm going to evaluate the function phi at that point and associate that value with the little block. Okay, So now, rather than just summing up the areas of the blocks, I can take a weighted sum. I can say the bigger the value of phi is for that block, the more contribution it makes to my sum. And again, if the domain omega is nice enough, if the function phi is nice enough, that as we chop this up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, we will approach the integral of the function phi over the domain omega. Okay, So the key perspective here is that integrals of functions can be viewed as weighted sums of area. We're kind of saying, each of these little squares doesn't have its usual size, but we have this function phi that tells us how to shrink or expand that size for the purpose of our integral. Okay, And that perspective is going to make it easy to understand what it means to integrate differential forms. Because, after all, that's kind of what differential forms do. They tell us how big a little piece of area should be considered. Okay, So, for instance, let's think about integrating a two-form. So again, we have our favorite domain, omega, and we have a differential two-form little omega on big omega. Okay, And now, 
rather than just having a point P at the center of each of these squares, we're also going to have two directions, the two vectors along the bottom and the left side of each little square. Okay. So what that means is we can use our two form to evaluate the size of each of these little blocks by grabbing the value of the two form at the point P and sticking in these two vectors U and V. Okay, hopefully you have a good enough feel for two forms by now to, to understand what's going on here. Two form says give me two vectors and I will give you the area of the parallelogram spanned by those two vectors. In this case, that parallelogram is just this little square, right? But that two form can vary over the domain omega, which means it can associ associate a different size to each of these little squares. Okay? So we can sum these values up over the whole domain. And if we chop this up into smaller and smaller pieces, we approach some value, and that is what we will call the integral of this differential two form. Okay? And what you observe is that this process is really no different from what we just did a moment ago. The only thing we did is, well, there we multiplied area times some value. Here we have a two form, which is always the area form times some value at each point. Right? So integration always involves differential forms. When, whenever we're taking an integral, we're just measuring little volumes weighted by some scalar function, adding them up. Okay. Here's an example in coordinates that hopefully makes that a little more concrete. So consider a differential two form on the unit square in the plane. Okay, so omega is going to be the two form x plus xy times dx wedge dy. dx wedge dy is the area form for the plane. It just gives us the usual notion of area. And x plus xy is some rescaling of that usual notion of area. In this case, by a function that looks like this, that grows bigger as we go to the upper right. Okay, so what is the integral of omega? Let's see, we integrate over the unit square, x plus xy dx wedge dy. Okay, and this is the moment where you say, oh, dx wedge dy, that's really no different from dx dy. Right? Normally I'd skip the wedge, I'd just say I'm integrating with respect to x and I'm integrating with respect to y. This is really just a change of notation from what you normally do. So you could think of this integral as a double integral from 0, 1 and 0, 1 over x and y of the function x plus xy. And from here, everything proceeds exactly as it always does. I won't even work through the details because you've probably done so many integrals of this kind in, in your life, in your multidimensional calculus class, right, that you, you understand what, what should happen here. Okay? So hopefully that makes you appreciate that integration of differential forms is no different from just integration. By the time you have the final expression that you need to evaluate, you're just integrating a function with respect to the usual area or volume measure. Where this maybe gets a little more interesting is if we start thinking about integrating over things like curves or surfaces. So for instance, let's think about a curve gamma in the plane and a differential one form, alpha, over, again, the whole plane. What does it mean to integrate alpha over gamma? Right? To be clear, we're not trying to integrate alpha over the whole plane. We're not trying to integrate alpha over a two-dimensional region of the plane. We're really just trying to integrate it along gamma. So what do you think you might do? Well, this time maybe not completely obvious, but we're going to follow the same basic recipe. We're going to chop up our domain of integration, in this case gamma, into little pieces, into little segments of the curve. For each segment, we can pick some point, maybe the point in the middle of the segment, 
and also grab the tangent to the curve at that point. Right? So we're assuming here that gamma is at least a differentiable curve. Okay, And so then we think, well, what kind of measurement can we take? What does a one-form do? A one-form takes a measurement of length or kind of oriented length. It says, if you give me a tangent vector, I will tell you how far that tangent vector points in a particular direction, in this case, alpha. Okay, So we can say the integral is roughly sum up over all these little segments, alpha evaluated at each point p, at each one of these midpoints, applied to the tangent vector at that midpoint. Right? Of course, I would have gotten slightly different values if I'd slid the point p somewhere else within that segment. Okay, But that's giving me a rough sense of how much this little piece of the curve lines up with the one form alpha. And so if I, as usual, take smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of this curve, assuming it's sufficiently regular, then this will converge to the integral. That's what we mean by the integral of a one form over a curve. Okay, let that sink in for a moment. This is a little bit new and different. And then I'll ask another interesting question, which is, what about the integral of star alpha? If I take the Hodge star of alpha, and I want to integrate that over this same curve, what do I do? Well, OK, the first thing that comes to mind is just copy <laughs> the expression from the previous line. I already know how to integrate any one form. Why should it be any different to integrate the Hodge star of this one form? OK, so I just go ahead and do it. I say I sum up over each little piece, star alpha applied to t. What does star alpha mean? It kind of means I rotate alpha 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction, and then I apply it to the vector t. OK, so now rather than measuring the strength of the flow along gamma, right, I could think of this as I rotate the field, the one form, by 90 degrees, and I ask, what's the total flux through gamma? Good way to see that is, well, this expression is the same as leaving alpha alone. Don't apply the Hodge star to alpha. Don't change alpha. But do rotate the argument by 90 degrees in the opposite direction. So take the tangent and do a clockwise 90 degree rotation. That'll give me the same expression. Right. Here's a concrete example. So consider, for instance, integrating a constant one form, alpha equals dy, so just the one form going vertically with constant magnitude, over the unit circle. So now gamma is this parameterized unit circle that sends an arc length s to the point cosine s sine s. Okay. What is the integral of alpha along the whole circle from 0 to 2 pi? Well, let's go ahead and just plug in our definitions. So we said, how do we integrate a one form along a curve? We go to each point of the curve, so we go to each point gamma of s. We evaluate the one form alpha at that point, so alpha sub gamma of s. And then we use that alpha to measure the tangent at that same point on the curve, t of s. Okay. The important thing to understand at this moment is that alpha of t is just an ordinary scalar function. By the time you're done evaluating this, this is a number for each s. Right? So we can see what that number is. We say, oh, it's alpha sub gamma of s applied to, well, the tangent is just the derivative of the curve gamma because gamma is arc length parameterized. So we have minus sine of s d dx plus cosine s d dy ds. Okay. And then we can plug in the definition of alpha. Alpha is just dy at every point. So what are we asking? We're asking what is the y component of the tangent at each point of the curve? And then integrating that up. 
What is the y component? Well, it's just that second component, cosine of s. And finally, as claimed, I just have an ordinary integral, right? 0 to 2 pi of cosine s ds. What is this integral, by the way? What is this equal to? Well, you could do this the easy way or the hard way. The hard way is to just forget about the geometry, forget about intuition, and just turn the crank on what you learned in your calculus class, right? So you find an antiderivative for cosine, and then you apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then that tells you you should take the difference of the antiderivative at the two endpoints, and after several lines of calculations, you get the result. What's the easy way to do this? Well, the easy way to do this is to go back to the original expression, maybe the, the expression that says we're integrating alpha of t over the curve. We remember that alpha is constant. It's always measuring the vertical component of the tangent. And for each point on the circle where I have a tangent t, I can find the opposite point where I have the tangent minus t, right? So alpha of t and alpha of minus t are going to evaluate to equal and opposite values. If I add up or integrate those values over the whole circle, I'm going to get zero. Right? Really easy to see, no trigonometry required. And, and certainly if you're comfortable with physics, there's all sorts of physical analogies you can make here. Okay, but this is why this geometric picture on integration is helpful and right? makes you appreciate that this integral is while well, you're just measuring the tangent as you walk around the curve. And so when you get into more complicated scenarios, this kind of geometric reasoning can help you very quickly figure out things that otherwise would be a huge pain if you tried to do it algebraically. Okay, so let's move on to Stokes' theorem. And if you've kind of tuned out, if you're playing the lecture in the background right now, this would be a good time to tune back in because Stokes' theorem is one of the most important theorems in all of mathematics. It's a really, really beautiful theorem. What does it say? So to understand Stokes' theorem, we do have to understand one more piece, which is the idea of boundary. So intuitively, if I show you this domain, this piece of the plane, and I ask you, what does its boundary look like? What do you think? Which part of this drawing would you call the boundary? Well, if you said this black curve, you're right. That's the boundary in this case. What if I show you this curve in the plane and ask you, what's its boundary? Okay, well, natural answer here would be to say it's these two endpoints, right? Kind of the only points that are that are different. Okay, so hopefully you at least have some intuition for what the boundary means. Can we be at least a little more precise? Well, sure, we could say at an interior point P of a k-dimensional set, to figure out if that point is a boundary point, we're going to take the intersection of an open ball around P and see if that set looks like an open k-dimensional ball. Right? Really what we're saying is can we find at least some, if we keep shrinking this ball smaller and smaller and smaller, can we eventually get a ball that's small enough so the intersection just looks like an open k-dimensional ball? If so, then we say that point is an interior point. It's not a boundary point. Okay? It doesn't matter if all balls, like if I have a really big ball and the intersection doesn't look open, that's fine. I just have to be able to shrink it small enough so that the intersection is an open ball. Okay? All other points are boundary points. That's it. Now, the only detail here is, well, what does it mean to look like? Right? What does it mean to look like an open K-ball? If you really want to be formal about it, you could say it's homeomorphic to in the subspace topology. It's a continuous bijection with continuous inverse. If you don't know what any of that means, please don't worry about it. The picture and the rough definition really give you the right idea. Okay, so now, really important idea, which points are in the boundary of the boundary of a set? So let's just do this again intuitively. If I take this shape, 
and I take its boundary. We said that the boundary is this black curve. If I take this black curve and I ask you which points are on the boundary of this black curve, your answer is? Well, here's the picture. There they are. Those are the points on the boundary of this curve, right? There aren't any, or maybe I write the empty set symbol here just to indicate there's nothing, okay? No points. The boundary of a boundary is always empty. I certainly have interior points, okay? But I can't find a point, no matter how hard I try, where if I keep shrinking my ball around that point, I won't eventually get an open segment along that curve, okay? All right, so now we have all the pieces in place. Let's just go back, before we state Stokes' theorem, to a familiar idea, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right. So basic you might not even remember it or that it even had a name, but there is this thing called the fundamental theorem of calculus. What does it say? Well, it says if I have a function, let's say a function phi on the real line on an interval from A to B, okay, and let's say this function is differentiable, then the fundamental theorem of calculus says the integral of the derivative is equal to the difference of the values at the two endpoints. Right? The integral from a to b of partial phi partial x dx is equal to the value at b minus the value at a. Okay, Don't let that become just a bunch of symbols. It says something very, very obvious. It says, well, if I start walking from a to b, then well, there might be some change in phi that goes up a little bit, it goes down a little bit. Whatever happens, I know that by the time I get to the end, I have the value phi of b, <laughs> right? So the total change that occurred, no matter what happened inside, is just the difference between the value I started with and the value I ended up with. Okay? Stokes' theorem says something very similar, but in a more general way. So let's just state it, and then we'll look at a few examples and make it really, really clear what this means. So Stokes' theorem says that if I have a differential n minus 1 form on an n-dimensional domain omega, then the integral over omega of the exterior derivative d of alpha is equal to the integral over the boundary of the domain of alpha. Okay, we can at least check that things kind of work out in terms of dimension, right? Alpha is an n minus 1 form. If I take its derivative, the exterior derivative always increases the degree by 1. So d alpha is an n form. It measures little n-dimensional volumes. And I'm taking an integral over an n-dimensional volume. That's good. Likewise, if I take the boundary of an n-dimensional domain, I get a n minus 1 dimensional domain, and I'm integrating a n minus 1 form over that domain. Okay? But that doesn't tell you anything at all about what this means yet. So let's look at a couple examples. First, let's look at the divergence theorem from vector calculus. What did the divergence theorem say? Well, let's say in two dimensions, let's say I have a vector field x on my domain omega. Right, so I have this, you can imagine this is, I don't know, water flowing around in this domain. Then the divergence theorem says the integral over the whole domain omega of the divergence of x, nabla dot x, dA, is equal to the integral over the boundary of the domain of the normal component of the vector field, n dot x dL. Okay, so intuitively, again, if this is kind of like water getting pumped into the domain, the divergence is measuring how much new water is arriving or leaving, right? So if I have a positive divergence, maybe water is entering the domain. If I have negative divergence, it's getting sucked out. It's going down a pipe or something. Okay, the right-hand side of the equation is saying how much water is flowing out of the boundary. Or maybe you can imagine this is pouring over the sides. It's how much I'm losing. So what is the divergence theorem saying? It's just saying what goes in must come out. Whatever water I'm pumping into the domain has to then get pushed over the sides. 
Okay, so the divergence theorem should have maybe been just called the what goes in must come out theorem. Would have made it seem way more obvious, right? Okay, so how else can we write the divergence theorem? Well, let's think about the fact that the exterior derivative kind of lets us express these same vector calculus operators. And so we should be able to write something similar down using differential forms. Well, if you remember back to our last lecture on the exterior derivative, then you know that kind of the analogous thing to taking the divergence of a vector field is applying d star to a differential one form, let's say alpha. Okay? And what Stokes' theorem would say is that the integral over omega of d star alpha is the same as, well, I take that d and I kind of move it into the domain. I turn the, the d of the integrand into the boundary of the domain. So I integrate over the boundary, star alpha. Does this right-hand side have anything to do with the right-hand side of the divergence theorem? Does it have anything to do with the integral of n dot x over the boundary? Well, sure. Think back to our discussion of integrating a one form over a curve. We said that integrating star alpha over a curve gamma is the same as integrating alpha over that curve, but plugging in the normal rather than the tangent. Right? We rotate the tangent by 90 degrees rather than rotating the one form by 90 degrees. Okay? So in fact, this expression, integral over the boundary of omega star alpha, is exactly the same as integrating the normal component of our vector field. Right? Again, what goes in must come out. Let's look at another example, Green's theorem. What did Green's theorem say in vector calculus? Yet another uh, in a long list of theorems that you may have forgotten. Green's theorem says that if I, again, have a vector field x on my domain, then integrating the curl of the vector field, nabla cross x, is the same as integrating over the boundary the tangent dot x. What does this mean geometrically? Again, don't let this just be a bunch of symbols. Well, if the divergence theorem was the what goes in must come out theorem, I would call this the what goes around comes around theorem. Right? It's saying I have all these little vortices on the interior spinning around. If I integrate up those vortices, that spinning, I get the left-hand side. That's going to be the same as the total amount that the field is going around the outer boundary. Okay. Can we translate this somehow into exterior calculus? Well, let's give it a try. So again, rather than having a vector field x, let's think about a differential one form alpha. What is the analog of the curl with the exterior derivative and, and one forms? So again, maybe you remember from our last lecture that that's just d alpha. d alpha is really similar to this idea of taking curl. Okay, we can make that more precise. What does Stokes' theorem tell us to do here? Well, this is just kind of the standard form of Stokes' theorem. The integral of d alpha over omega is the same as the integral of alpha over the boundary of omega. Does this second expression correspond somehow to the integral of t dot x over the boundary? Well, sure. Right? Our whole idea of integrating over a curve is to take the tangent to the curve and stick it into the one form alpha. Alpha measuring the tangent to the boundary is very much like taking a dot product between x and the tangent to the boundary. Okay, So in this two-dimensional case, up to some superficial identifications, Stokes' theorem is really telling you about Green's theorem. Okay? So overall, these examples, divergence theorem, Green's theorem, and so forth, really should give you a strong intuition for what Stokes' theorem is all about intuitively. Right? Stokes' theorem is telling you this really amazing fact that you can tell all sorts of stuff about what's going on inside a domain by just looking at what's going on on the boundary. 
Or if you want to think about this a little more philosophically, you could say that the change that we see on the outside is purely a function of the change within. A beautiful story. Okay, one last example to really drive this idea home. What exactly is the relationship between the fundamental theorem of calculus and Stokes' theorem? Well, we can go back to this picture of a function on the interval a, b. And remember, the fundamental theorem says that if we integrate from a to b, the derivative of phi with respect to x, we get the difference of the values on the endpoints. So we could also write this by saying, OK, let's integrate over the interval a, b, d phi, the differential of phi. Stokes' theorem would tell us that that's the same as just integrating phi over the boundary of the interval. What is the boundary of the interval a, b? Well, it's just the two points, a and b, right? Except that the relative orientation of these points is different at the two endpoints of the curve. The curve is oriented from a to b, so positive orientation at b, negative orientation at a. And so the integral of phi over those two points is just phi b minus phi a. Okay, so Stokes' theorem really is a strict generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's also a generalization of the divergence theorem and Green's theorem. It's also a generalization of a lot of other theorems that you'll encounter in calculus and complex analysis and so forth. We can also use Stokes' theorem to understand this interesting property of the exterior derivative that the d of d is zero, right? Whenever we see an expression like d, d, phi, we know to immediately replace that with zero. Well, let's suppose for a moment that that wasn't part of our definition of the exterior derivative. We don't take that for granted, but we do know about Stokes' theorem. Okay, what would we then discover? Well, what we could do, actually any time you see d of some form, you think, hmm, maybe it's interesting to integrate that form over some domain. So let's try integrating that over omega. Stokes' theorem says that this integral is equivalent to what? Okay, it says, well, we can just peel away one of the d's and instead integrate over the boundary of the domain omega. Okay, and then interesting, okay, we're again integrating the derivative of a form over some domain. So what might we do next? Ah, well, we can just apply Stokes' theorem again. We can integrate now just phi over the boundary of the boundary of omega. Okay, that's interesting. What do we do now? Is there a way of simplifying this expression? Well, hopefully you remember from earlier on that the boundary of the boundary is always empty. So now we're integrating the function phi over the empty set. And what does that integrate to? It always integrates to zero. We have nothing. We're measuring nothing. Okay, now that doesn't yet tell us that d d phi is equal to zero at every point. It just means if we integrate it over omega, some set omega, we get zero. Okay, but we can do that for any set we like, no matter how small. And so if we want to understand what does the function or the differential form d, d, phi look like at a point, I can just shrink the set omega smaller and smaller and smaller around the point of interest, and every time I do this calculation, I will discover that the result is zero. And so what that tells me is, indeed, d, d, phi is zero at every single point. Okay, so let's now revisit our discussion of the exterior derivative, right? Before we said the exterior derivative d is the unique linear map from differential k forms to differential k plus 1 forms, such that on zero forms we just get the differential, we get a, a one form whose components are the partial derivatives, we have a product rule, d of alpha wedge beta is the same as d alpha wedge beta plus or minus alpha wedge d beta, and we said 
we have, for some reason, this exactness property, d of d is equal to zero. We argued for the differential by saying, okay, well, we want something that behaves like the gradient for functions. If I stick in a function, I really need to know all the different derivatives in all possible directions. We argued for the product rule geometrically by saying, okay, well, when you have a product, you know, there's these little pieces that come up when you make a little change and so on. But maybe this discussion of exactness wasn't completely satisfying. We said, oh, it would be nice if it behaves like, you know, curl of gradient is equal to zero. Well, here's a completely different way of motivating it that's maybe a little more satisfying is to say, just how about Stokes' theorem, right? What goes in must come out. And also the boundary of the boundary is equal to zero, right? Two things that are, that are pretty natural. Okay. So to summarize, we talked about integration and we said that the main idea of integration is to break the domain into small pieces and then measure them and add them up. How do we measure small pieces? We've just spent several lectures developing a language for measuring small pieces, and that's the language of differential forms. Stokes' theorem gives us the critical relationship between integration and differentiation. It says that integrating over some region, the derivative of something is the same as integrating that thing over the boundary of that region. So this is a really nice tool because it lets us convert region integrals into boundary integrals. Sometimes it's easier to integrate over a surface rather than integrating over a whole volume. It's also super useful because it lets us skip a derivative, right? There may be cases, especially when we start talking about discrete objects, where we don't know how to define the derivative, but we do know how to define an integral. That was kind of the case when we looked at curvature of curves. If you remember, we said, ooh, I don't know how to take the second derivative of this polygonal curve, but I can still integrate the change of its tangent along some little piece. That, in fact, was an application of Stokes' theorem. Now that you know Stokes' theorem, you'll see applications and special cases of it all over the place. We saw today divergence theorem, Green's theorem, fundamental theorem of calculus. There's also this thing called Cauchy's integral theorem in complex analysis and many, many more. It gets applied over and over again in computing, in signal processing, image processing, geometry processing. It really is kind of sitting at the foundation of finite element methods and boundary element methods where you want to avoid meshing the interior of your domain and just work with the boundary mesh. For us, it's going to be the key idea for translating differential forms into the discrete setting. So the way that we're going to build up discrete exterior calculus and our notion of differentiation on meshes is really to apply Stokes' theorem. Okay, so a really important part of this lecture to, to get your head around. Our last topic for today related to integration is the question of how to take inner products of differential K forms. Just to review, what is an inner product? Well, remember that a vector space V is any collection of sort of little arrows or arrow-like objects that can be added and scaled and so forth. Okay, so if that's a vector space, what's an inner product on a vector space? What did that mean in your linear algebra class? Well, you could probably rattle off some definition, but more important is, what does it mean geometrically? So loosely speaking, an inner product is something that gives us a way to talk about how big a vector is, how long a vector is, or angles between vectors, right? It starts to actually associate some geometry with those, those vectors. So if we have a vector u, for instance, we might say the square of its length is the inner product of u with itself. If we have two vectors u and v, then we might know that the inner product of u and v is the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between them. Or really, you might say, this is how we define length. This is how we define angle for that vector space. Okay. We can be more formal about it. We could say, more formally, an inner product is any symmetric positive definite bilinear map 
So any function that takes a pair of vectors as input and gives a number as output with a few natural properties. One is the inner product of u with v is the same as v with u. Okay, that makes sense if we think about angle, right? The angle between two vectors shouldn't matter if we exchange the order that we hand it to the inner product. And other properties that you can argue that should be natural. Linearity, okay, if I add u and v, take the inner product with w, that really should be no different from taking the inner product with u and w and then adding that to v and w, and so on. Importantly, inner product is always positive definite, right? The inner product of any vector with itself is non-negative, and it's zero if and only if that vector itself is zero, okay? So if you don't completely understand why each of these rules exists, I would encourage you to go and try to draw a picture. Try to make sure you, you understand it because we're going to start to apply these rules to more exotic objects. The most basic inner product you're usually introduced to is the inner product of two vectors in Euclidean space. How do you do that? Well, in short, you just sum up the products of the components. So if u is a vector with components u1 through un, in a basis E1 through EN, and V is a vector with components V1 through VN in the same basis, then the inner product of these two vectors is just the sum from I equals one up through N of UI times VI, okay? Okay, hopefully this is an easy idea, but fine, just a little example. Let's say U is three E1 plus two E2, and V is two E1 plus four E2, then the inner product is what? Okay, just 3 times 2 plus 2 times 4, which hopefully equals 14. Now, just because I used the word inner product when I defined this operation doesn't mean it's an inner product. So to really know, you have to check. Does this operation of summing up products of components, does that satisfy all the rules, all the requirements of an inner product? Okay, you can check that on your own if you like. Here's another important inner product, which is very different from the Euclidean inner product, and that's an inner product of functions. So collections of functions, or at least certain types of functions, are also vector spaces. For instance, if I just think about ordinary functions on the unit interval 0, 1, right, I can do all the same kinds of things with those functions that I can do with little arrows in the plane. I can add two functions together and I get another function. I can subtract two functions. I can scale a function up by a constant and so on. Okay. So in this context, this more unusual context, what does it mean to measure an inner product? Right? Like, can I think about the angle between two functions? That feels kind of weird. And it is maybe a little bit weird, but we can still cook up a pretty meaningful notion of what it means for two functions to line up well, right? That's kind of what the inner product of little arrows in the plane captures. How well do these two arrows line up? If they line up a lot, the inner product is big. If they don't line up very well, the inner product is small. If they point in opposite directions, the inner product might be negative. We can ask that kind of question for functions, right? Let's say I have these two functions, f and g versus these two functions, f and g. Which of these pairs lines up better? I think it's pretty clear the two functions on the top are kind of better aligned than the ones on the bottom. So how do we really say this? How do we really define an inner product for functions like this? Well, one idea is just to mimic what we did for the Euclidean dot product. So there we went to every entry of our vectors. We took the components of both vectors. We multiplied them together and we summed up those products. Okay, so if I have two functions f and g from the unit interval to the reals, then I can define some operation where I go to every point on that interval. I grab the values of those two functions, f of x and g of x. I multiply them together and I add them up, or really I integrate up those values. Okay, just like the Euclidean dot product. This is called the L2 inner product. And it's defined not for all functions, 
but for any functions where the integral of the square is finite. So square integrable functions. Why do we make that restriction? Well, suppose I plugged in f and f, right? I say g is equal to f. Well, for this to be well-defined, I need to have that the integral of f squared takes some real value, okay? So that's nice. Does it do what we wanted? Does it capture the notion of two functions lining up? So for instance, if we applied this L2 inner product to the two pairs of functions drawn on this slide, which one would be bigger? Which inner product would be bigger? Hopefully it's clear the one on the top would be bigger, the one on the bottom would be smaller. Why? Well, because on the bottom there are very few points where f and g both have large values. On the top there's this dark blue region where both f and g have pretty big values. Right? Okay, is it actually an inner product? Does it actually obey all the rules of the inner product? Here you have to be a little bit careful, you can get really in the weeds about this, and I'll let you check that and think about that on your own. Okay, so we've talked about the inner product of vectors in Rn, kind of the usual thing. We kind of generalized that and talked about inner products of functions. Let's generalize that a little bit more and talk about inner products of differential k-forms. So in particular, if I have two k-forms, alpha and beta, let's say this is on a n-dimensional space, then their L2 inner product is defined as the integral over this n-dimensional region, omega, of star alpha wedge beta. Okay, before talking about what this means, just a couple notes about notation. One is that you notice here I'm using double angle brackets and that I also use that for the L2 inner product. So generally in this course, if you see single angle brackets, that's for the inner product of vectors in Rn. If you see double angle brackets, that's something about inner products of functions or differential forms. The reason we do that is there's often differential forms that are defined in terms of inner products of vectors in Rn. And so this would get really confusing if we always use the same kind of angle brackets. Another little note is that some authors, if you look in some textbooks, you'll see that the inner product on k-forms is defined in terms of the integrand alpha wedge star beta instead of star alpha wedge beta. This is just a convention, just like we might pick which direction the normals of a curve point, right, or whatever. Okay, so this convention for us is consistent with the idea that the one form Hodge star is a counterclockwise rotation. Okay, so with the notation out of the way, let's try to understand a little bit, you know, what, what does this mean, what does this do? Let's start with the, the easiest case. So what happens if k is equal to zero? Well, in that case, we're just saying we want to take the inner product of two differential zero forms. What is a differential zero form? Well, it's just a really, really fancy name for a scalar function. And in that case, this is just going to reduce to the L2 inner product on scalar functions. Why is that the case? Well, star alpha is going to take a zero form to an n form. It's going to take us to just a scalar multiple of the usual volume form. So for in 3D, this would be like dx wedge dy wedge dz times two functions. Okay? Another important question is, what is the degree of the integrand? Let's just think about that algebraically. So alpha and beta are both k-forms. The Hodge star will take a k-form to an n minus k-form. And the wedge product will add the degrees of the forms. So we have n minus k plus k is equal to n. Okay, so the integrand is an n-form. Why is that important? Why do we need it to be an n-form? Well, we're trying to integrate an n-dimensional volume, and so we need a measuring device that can measure little pieces of an n-dimensional volume. Okay? So that gives some motivation for our definition, but to really understand it, let's look at a few examples. So for example, 
Let's consider two one forms on the unit square given by alpha is equal to du, so just a constant one form in the horizontal direction, and beta is v du minus u dv. Okay. Something that actually varies over space. What is their inner product? Okay. So what do you think intuitively? What, what, what would an inner product between alpha and beta capture? Well, the idea is it should capture something about, well, how well these two one forms line up overall. So let's see, does that happen? Well, let's plug in our definition. So we said the L2 inner product of two one forms is, we integrate over the domain, the unit square, star alpha wedge beta. What's star alpha? Well, we rotate du 90 degrees in a counterclockwise direction to get dv, wedge that with beta, okay? How do we wedge it with beta? Well, we can distribute the wedge over the difference. We can simplify, we notice dv wedge dv is zero, and so we're left with just minus the integral over the square, v du wedge dv. Hey, look, again, it's just a normal integral. It's just an integral of the function v over the square. So what is the result? It's, well, in this case, it happens to be minus 1 half. If we took the L2 inner product of alpha with something orthogonal to alpha, like star alpha, that might be much smaller. It might be 0. If we took the inner product of alpha with something that lines up better with alpha, like, I don't know, alpha, that inner product might be bigger. Okay, but hopefully this gives you a sense of of how this works and what it means. And right? at each point we're seeing how well are alpha and beta lined up and then summing that or integrating that quantity up over the whole domain. Okay, that's it. That's the last thing we have to say about integration. And in fact, that is the last thing that we have to say about differential forms in the smooth setting before we move on to the discrete case. Okay, so let's take a big step back and talk about all the things we've said so far. So first of all, I should point out that so far we've only talked about exterior calculus in the flat case, in Rn. Okay, we will come back when we study curves and surfaces and think about how do we incorporate curvature into this story. So a big idea in exterior calculus is to make a distinction between vectors and covectors even though they often looked almost exactly the same, right? We get this idea that one gets measured and one does the measuring, but otherwise they, they look very similar. Well, when we come back around to curved spaces, things are going to get a whole lot more interesting because the inner product we use is no longer just the ordinary Euclidean dot product. And so all these relationships we had where we said, okay, alpha sharp or x flat involve the inner product, are actually going to mean something very significant about the geometry. So to motivate this just a little bit, and you don't need to completely understand this at the moment, let's say we have a curved surface sitting in space. Well, one way to often do calculations on that surface is to write it down as the image of some map F that takes a region of the plane and stretches it out into a curved surface. When we do that stretching, these vectors that sit on the surface are also going to get stretched and pulled around. And what that means is using the Euclidean dot product in the plane is the wrong way to measure the angle between vectors. Okay, So if we really want to get our calculations right, if we really want to account for the fact that the surface is curved, we'll need this language of exterior calculus and vectors versus covectors. Okay, But we will return to this perspective later on when we actually talk about uh, geometry of, of curves and surfaces. To talk just about what we did in Rn, what did we do? Well, the first thing we did was we introduced exterior algebra, which is a little language all on its own for talking about volumes, k-dimensional volumes. And the basic idea there was we can wedge together k vectors to get something called a k-vector. We then introduced a dual language of k-forms, K-forms are not k-dimensional volumes, but rather 
measurements that we can take of k-dimensional volumes. Okay, then just as in vector calculus, we put a vector at every point of space to get a vector field. We put a k-form at every point of space to get a differential k-form. Exterior calculus is the sort of generalization of vector calculus from vector fields to differential forms. So in particular, we saw the exterior derivative, which captures all the derivatives we had from vector calculus, the gradient, the divergence, the curl, and much, much more. And today we talked about integration of differential forms. Right? And what we saw today really motivates this idea of a differential form. Whenever you've been integrating something in your entire life, you've effectively been integrating differential forms. Right? Your integrand says, how much should this part of the domain count for my whole integral? I'm going to take a little measurement of volume, and then I'm going to scale it up or down by a function, by the integrand. Before we started talking about exterior calculus, we actually were talking about something discrete. We talked about meshes and simplicial complexes, and in particular, the idea of an oriented simplicial complex, right, where every edge has a direction, every face has an orientation. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to put all this machinery together. You might have already noticed some similarities between our discussion of oriented simplicial complexes and differential k-forms. We have things of different degrees k. If I change orientations, signs flip. This is not a coincidence. And what we're going to see next is that by integrating differential k-forms, over the elements of a oriented simplicial complex, we're going to get a language for talking about all of these things in the discrete case in a way that lets us do computation. Okay, that's it for today. Talk to you next time.